Hello, this is Dean Banerjee, and welcome to the TI Precision Lab on Clock Tree Design. In this video, we will discuss the considerations that need to be made when designing a clock tree. After watching this video, you'll be able to identify key clocking specifications that need to be considered during part selection and frequency planning. We'll start with a quick summary of the different types of clocking devices that were mentioned throughout the TI Precision Lab's clock and timing video series and a few common clock trees. Then we'll go through some examples of common clock trees. After that, let's focus on system level aspects of clock tree design, which include power, area, price, and reliability. Following that, we will discuss output and input clock requirements, such as synchronization, frequencies, formats, jitter, and number of outputs needed. Oscillators are a self-driving source that start off the clock tree. They serve as an input to the next device in the tree, which would be a buffer, clock generator, or synthesizer. Buffers distribute multiple copies of the same input clock frequency. Clock generators can generate multiple frequencies from a different input frequency clock provided at the input. Clock generators do this using PLLs, VCOs, and different dividers and distribution paths. Jitter cleaners are a special type of clock generator that in addition to generating multiple frequencies can also generate clean clocks from a noisy input clock. Network synchronizers are a special type of clock generator that has the ability to synchronize multiple output clocks to each other or to the input clock. Synthesizers use high performance PLLs to generate very high frequency clocks. Let's discuss some common clock trees that we see commonly used in different markets. Clock generator based trees are common when the input source is sufficiently low noise do not require cleaning, and there are no network synchronization needs. When synchronization is required, a network synchronizer-based clock tree is used. Jitter cleaners are used when the input clock jitter is too high and needs to be cleaned. Synthesizer-based trees tend to have fewer outputs that are higher frequency. Let's talk about system-level constraints. System-level constraints are requirements that must be met by the clock tree as a whole or by each individual device in the tree. Examples of these are power consumption, price, area, reliability, and synchronization. Getting the right balance between these may require multiple iterations. Power consumption is one key aspect of system design. The first step in considering power consumption is the understanding that performance often comes at the expense of higher power or higher price. Sometimes semiconductor suppliers have different product families that can be optimized for performance or power. For example, the Texas Instruments LMK family of devices is more optimized for performance, whereas the CDC family of devices is more optimized for lower power. The second step is to identify the power rails required from all the devices used. In this example, we see that the CDCE937 requires a 1.8 volt device supply voltage and a flexible output supply voltage that can be set anywhere between 2.3 and 3.6 volts. As these voltages cannot be made the same, the CDCE937 is not a single supply device. However, the CDCE-L937 is an example of a single supply device because the device supply voltage and the output supply voltage can be set to the same value. Identifying the supply voltages is critical because it impacts the LDO and switching regulators that are used. Multiple power supply rails can make your design difficult especially in space-constrained and low-cost systems. The third step is to add up the current associated with each power supply rail. Let's say you decide to use two power rails in your system, a 1.8 and a 3.3 volt power supply rail. Skip through each of the data sheets and approximate how much current will be consumed by each device and add them up. Multiply the current with the voltage to get the power consumption of each power rail in your system. The fourth step is to add up the power consumption of each supply rail and get the total power consumption for your system. If the power is too high, you will need to make performance sacrifices in order to meet your power budget. In some battery-powered applications, the inactive current or power-down current of the system may be of interest. This determines the power consumption of the device when it is not in operating mode. Everything comes with a price. In addition to the price on the web pages of your devices, Manufacturers will often have a parametric search tool to make your selection process easier. 
The next system level constraint is the total area of the clock tree design. Total area is somewhat difficult to accurately predict before starting the PCB layout. Accounting for and approximating the known requirements will help you ensure you do not run into spacing issues later in your design. The first step is to find the package dimensions of each of the devices considered for your clock tree design. Here we see that the LMX2820 has a 7 by 7 millimeter 48 pin VQFN package. The next step is to determine the external components that the LMX2820 requires. Since this device runs from a single 3.3 volt supply and has integrated LDOs, that eliminates the need for external LDOs, which saves area in your design. However, it does require an additional loop filter that consists of a couple of passives that will need to be added to the design. The middle figure highlights the resistors and capacitors that are part of the loop filter. Finally, the area should be budgeted for routing of traces. If you have high frequency RF traces, then you may want to also add some shielding vias. If you require length mass traces, you may use meander routing techniques. The application might have additional reliability or temperature qualifications. For example, automotive applications typically require AEC-Q100 qualified products that include increased requirements for electrostatic discharge and temperature. The CDCE 6214-Q1 is an example of an AEC-Q100 Grade 2 qualified product that is qualified to operate up to 105 degrees Celsius compared to the typical 85 degrees Celsius for commercial devices. Products used in space applications may require increased radiation immunity. One of the metrics used to classify radiation immunity is single event latch up, which is measured in mega electron volts and is tested by bombarding the device with heavy ions. An example of a de device would be the LMK04832 SP, which is single event latch up immune to 120 mega electron volts and is also packaged in a high reliability ceramic package. The final system level constraint we will discuss for the clock tree is if it is free running or synchronous. The output clocks of a free running application do not need to be in the same phase, nor in phases whose relationship is known. In synchronous applications, the phases of the different clocks are the same or can be determined. In some clocking devices, adjustable analog and digital delays enable you to align the phase of multiple clocks to adjust the phase to a specific offset of your choice. Adjustable delays may also be used to loosen stringent routing requirements. Identifying whether the application is for a free running or synchronous application will narrow down part selection choices. The next topic is understanding the output clock requirements, which can be broken down to the output frequencies needed, the number of output needed for each frequency, the output format of each clock, and the performance of each clock. Let's take a closer look. In this example, the RF SOC requires four ADC clocks and two DAC clocks, which adds to six clocks at two different frequencies. It also requires two other clock frequencies, a PL clock for its programmable logic interface, as well as a lower frequency PL sysref clock for clock synchronization. In this example, the LMX2820 is added because the LMK04832 cannot generate high enough frequencies for the ADC or DAC tiles of the RFSOC. The ADC and DAC clocks also need to meet minimum jitter performance in order to have the cleanest signal to noise ratio. Most receivers will require a minimum performance to function properly. This could be a combination of jitter, spot phase noise, noise floor, or spurs. It is important to identify which performance metrics are important to each of the output clocks. With this case, the RF SOC's ADC tiles, let's refer back to the TI Precision Lab's clock and timing jitter and phase noise definition. The clock source jitter limits the maximum frequency at a particular signal to noise ratio. To support the high sampling frequencies, the data converters must be clocked with high performance, low jitter clocks. This figure shows a representative plot of the achievable SNR in analog to digital converters with various jitter in a clock source. Effective SNR is given in the formula where sigma is the peak-to-peak -peak clock jitter. The last factor to consider while determining the system's output requirements is the output format of each clock. 
The output format of the clocking device must be compatible with the input clock requirements of the receiver. One needs to consider the voltage swing, common mode voltage, output termination, and whether the clock is differential or single-ended. The table shows the input common mode voltage and input swing requirements of the ADC12DJ3200 datasheet. To clock this, we must find a clocking device that has an output that is compatible with this input. Different clock drivers also require specific terminations at the clocking device output and the receiver input to generate a voltage swing or common mode voltages. Here are examples of LVDS and HCSL format terminations. Using a clock generator that can be programmed to generate different output formats reduces design complexity when clocking multiple receivers with different input clock requirements. Now let's think about input considerations. The first stage of a clocking device must accept a clock coming from another board, another system, or a self-driving clock source such as an oscillator. Similar to the output clocks going to the clock receivers in the system, the device chosen to receive the input clock must also be compatible to the input signal swing. In this example, the clock generators of PCB number one and PCB number two must both be able to accept 200 MHz output from PCB number zero. The input frequency must fall within the range of acceptable input frequencies for the clock generator's input drive, and it must be compatible to the common mode voltage and the frequency swing of the buffer's output. The input jitter for some types of clocking devices can be transferred to the output. If this transfer jitter is not sufficiently lower than the inherent jitter of the clocking device, then one may consider using a jitter cleaner. Jitter cleaners typically use a first stage to clean up the jitter and multiply this up with a second stage. For the LMK04318B and the LMK5C33216, the first stage is a DPLL using a ball oscillator. In the case of the LMK04832, the first stage is a PLL with external VCXO. Thanks for watching this video on Clock Tree Design. Please take a few minutes to test your understanding of the concepts presented in this video by taking the short quiz. Now that we have identified all the system level requirements and output input requirements, it's time to see how we can generate different output frequencies from the same PLL. In the next two videos, let's explore frequency planning. If you need more information on our clock and timing products, visit ti.com backslash clocks.